When Steel Talks, everybody listens. When Steel Talks is here in Brooklyn, New York, in the Panyard of Crossfire Steel Orchestra with arranger Leon Foster Thomas. Welcome to When Steel Talks. And uh, we are really happy to finally be able to have a chance to sit down face to face and have a really great interview um, with you simply because we've been doing write in so far. And there's just so much one wants to type in terms of a response. So now we are really free to exchange ideas and, of course, share what you have to say with the global steel pan community so um welcome once more and let's uh deal with uh, the panorama aspect first uh, in new york and then we'll talk a bit more about leon foster thomas the performer the artist and the person who is one of the global steel band ambassadors okay all right, all right so for the 2011 new york panorama season any surprises so far um no, not really. You know, I don't think we have had any any surprises. It's it's pretty much the well, I would say yeah, actually surprises musically. It's a lot a lot of things been coming musically, especially based on the tune. What do you mean by coming musically? Um, and the tune, by the way, is Trini. Yeah, Benja is Trini. Okay. Yeah, we do we're doing Trini, and um, it's just so many elements of the, that you grew up on, so it's actually coming back like this thing pop in today and it might pop in something else might pop in tomorrow that would remind you of your childhood or old time trinidad or, or trinidad no everything about trinidad it's coming right into the music and so that wealth of experience is finding musical expression yes all right um who made the decision for the song and why i did oh okay <laughs> I, I was pretty much fortunate to, to get that little bit of leeway because I had chosen, actually I didn't want to do Trini. I, um, I, I liked uh, Calling Me mm -hmm. and um, I thought Trini was more of a gimmick than anything <laughs> else, honest to God. So mm -hmm. we, uh, because I thought, you know, okay, somebody would do Trini just because, you know. And um, one day I was, I was, um, I had actually just heard Desperados played it. And, I wasn't, I mean, you know, I wasn't really too moved by it. And then, you know, I let that pass, and the next day I just heard, um, just started hearing ideas. Ideas upon ideas. So I took my phone and I started singing into the phone all the ideas. And I, I called up Dougie and I said, um, What do you think about Trini? So, well, it's up to you. And I said, Well, okay, we're going with that. So, because I had enough ideas from the start, um, even at the end of the tune, I know where, the, where I want to go. I have a decent roadmap of voice notes that I um, put on my phone and then I score the music. Hmm. So how far are you down in terms of imparting the music to the band? Uh, we just got to um, our first change key. Hmm. So our first key change and um, it's getting there. It's getting there. It's getting there. Okay. What is the response of the band to the music? The, the response has been really good actually. Okay. When I um, introduced the tune to the stage side Everybody was extremely excited about that. We want to go with Trini. So. And um, I don't see it have any turning back after that, <laughs> no, because we already decided. Yeah. And they love the tune. So it's just for me now to deliver the goods as in terms of uh, arrangement, and, um, that whole interpretation of what I think Trini is, and hopefully the band enjoys it. So you mentioned uh, singing into the phone your idea, so you had a pretty decent roadmap, as you mm -hmm. put it. Mm -hmm. um, when you are sharing the music with the band members, the ideas are still flowing then with little changes and whatnot. So you have the general gist, yes. but you're still continuing your arranging within the panty art mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a, I love it. I love it. I think, you know, you, you look at the expressions of the musicians playing and someone might just do something weird and you, get that idea that whole thing the vibes has changed after that so you know like last night <laughs> I had something totally planned okay this is all we're going to do it but then um one of the players started playing some chords and I kind of tried to ignore it <laughs> I, I, sat, I, I stood up right in front of the band and I tried to ignore it and when the band stopped I said hey, play that again <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we created a whole you different part you know and it, it was really good really good we didn't really go off we didn't go off course at all but it had this kind of um, inspiration of um, 
a boxy type vibe then so to speak you know so so that's kind of like some of my inspirational mm -hmm. Inspiration coming from Bugsy and you might, you know, some inspiration from Ken and all the people that I listen to. And that's a pretty good segue into talk a bit more about your experiences, the people whose music have inspired and still continue to do yeah. so. Um, well, first, Professor, I mean, Professor's the one who gave me the break to drum for a band. Ken Professor yeah, Fillmore. Yeah, Ken Fillmore. He, I drummed for Fawn Clair in 98. Hmm. I was like, I think it was 17. Wow. You know, and, um, a pretty awesome responsibility yeah. to your age. <laughs> I was scared <laughs> because, <laughs> because um, in the preliminaries or the South, the South finals, I made a mistake on the drums, and uh, all I could see is Professor holding his head, and he's like, "Oh God!" You know, <laughs> sticks went flying one way, and but the rhythm section was really good. That's one thing with Funkley. You had a very good rhythm section that you, you, they weren't too dependent on the drummer. So everybody else held their own. At the end of the four count, the band came in on time. But on the final night, the same part came again and I did it, but there was another part where the pedal stuck. So that was the quickest way, that's the fastest I ever took down a drum set and they never saw me. I mean, you know, I was, I was, you know, really scared about that. But then after that, you know, Ken called me again. We did Carnival as we, which is actually one of the most listened to panorama tunes for drums. Mm. At, you know, um, especially in the university circuit, um, a lot of people. Uh, you mean the final night performance? Yeah. Okay. No, actually, no, the the, the semi final. Okay. Because our final night, well, we got disqualified that year, mm. and um, the semi finals we had a recording, the sound recording, or what have you. Right. So a lot of people listen to that recording in terms of panorama drum and stuff like that. And then from Ken was Boogsy. Never had the chance to. Never even thought I would have met Boogsy. And just as I was sitting here, it's the same way I was drumming and Boogsy sitting right there. We were doing conga with Invaders. We are getting ready to go to Tennessee. And Boogsy asked, you want to hear the tune again? I said, no, I heard it. He said, you sure? So like, he looked at me like, OK, let me see what he's going to do. <laughs> and so said, just as how the record was, that's how I did it. I mean, and from there, Boogsy, you want to go Grenada or whatever, we, we started working together from then. So, and you know, Ray, the opportunity to work with Ray Hallman in, in 2005 alongside Bootsy for Trini going wild, that was one of the best experience yeah, ever, man. Yeah. You know, and I went up to Ray actually. It's like, Ray, I am so, I, my name is Leon Pastor Thomas. Yeah, I know who you are. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, you know, and it, it, it was cool for that. And, you know, and Robert Greenwich, I mean, I listen to Robbie, how he plays, man. It's, it's one of the best, the smoothest sensation you can get playing. I, 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 I kind of strive to get that that way of playing, mm -hmm. you know, to be able it's to... feel like pure liquid. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Robbie is, is the man. I mean, there's so many other people, I mean, you'll go pretty long. Too. Yeah, understood. But um, the whole environment, everybody, the... Everything from Glen Invaders, all the bands that I've experienced, that I've played with, has definitely inspired me to play. Outside of Soka, Calypso, I mean, you're a jazz, you're everything, mm -hmm. really. Um, which musicians inspire you outside of the steel band genre? <laughs> uh, okay, just, just give us a microphone. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, it, it, um, first of all, my father. My deceased father, he um, was an African drummer. He did the Arawak dance group and Katumba, Katumba performers and Pleasantville performers. And uh, we did some stuff with the national dance. Repertoire. Yeah. And um, he always had music. He always had music. One day you would see Stalin in the house, next day you would see Croker in the house. And, and he would be strumming his guitar and all that. I wasn't really too into all those things. I was playing African drums. but. Just the idea of just music everywhere. You know, there's a keyboard you walked in the house, there was a keyboard sitting there, and there was drums here. And uh, um, him and my mom, my mom was the vocalist and he was the drummer. So, um, and, you know, so from there, everything just took off from there. But um, in the old jazz arena, no, I mean, in the what really inspired Miles Davis, you have to love Miles Kind of Blue. I, that was actually my first jazz record. Kind of blue, and I heard um, um, 
<laughs> footprints. Like. So, I mean, and just how he did things with time and space and the music and all that kind of stuff. I mean, something else. How did you make the, uh, I won't say the marriage, but the link between, you know, the African drums and your percussionist, of course, mm. and then you're also a panist specifically? Um, well, I don't know. I never liked Pat, honest to God. No. Just thought it wasn't, didn't make sense to me. But the fact that uh, I got called to play with a steel band, a school steel orchestra in 93, Plus of a senior mm -hmm. with um, this guy Roger Charles and um, Roger Charles and short arms. He was arranging this song. That was my first time with Pan. I looked at the Pan and I was like, hey, "They playing that, you know?" And they <laughs> they they were playing Baron, somebody by Baron actually. I couldn't believe it actually, and but I was also um, embarrassed to the fact that I was was I was 13 or 14 years old and couldn't play pan and Atiba Williams was playing pan then I think he was like five or something like that and could play you know so I would borrow someone's spare sticks when they took breaks and I would put my head in the in the pan and just try to pick out the notes so from that you know just music and me I just had this kind of new thing I would break school and stuff like that too to go practice, borrow the pan and hook it up between the window at my house. Oh, interesting <laughs> transition from what is that to I need to get this thing yeah. done. I got I got I got really engulfed in it, you know, after the Pleasantville Senior experience, I played with Panasonic Connection the following year. That was my first panorama experience in ninety four. What did you play? Tenor? I played tenor. tenor. Okay. And then I went to went to Fonkle and I played African drums the same year. Mm -hmm. And um, the following year, I jumped on a four bass to play my pan club. We did Pan Rebellion in '95. That was a Darren Shepherd's arrangement, and they thought I was too wild on the four bass. I had the section. <laughs> I had the four bass section shaking all over the place. Yeah, they were, they had but we were vibing. Spread, we yeah, were vibing, right? and um, <laughs> I will never forget. I had the shades with one side of the um, the handle off, and but I'm still bobbing with my four bass, and they said. Um, they said I'm too good to be playing the four bass, come on a tenor. Because I would always try to play the panorama tune that I did before. And uh, from there on I stayed on the tenor. Have you know, so tried the double tenor? Yeah, I played everything, you know. <laughs> double tenor is pretty tough, you know. Exactly. It's, That's it's, what a, I'm it's a pretty tough pan. Yeah. Um, that experience I really wouldn't want people to see it. <laughs> 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 so, um, in a nutshell, you've had a panorama experience either as a panist, a percussionist on African mm -hmm. drums, or regular drummer, mm -hmm. and you've been uh, in Florida as an arranger before. Mm -hmm. you've, been a, you've been a winning arranger in Florida. Yeah. Um, you're here in New York now. This is your second year as an mm -hmm. arranger, and you're on the drum. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we know you've been, uh, you've started in Trinidad, mm -hmm. phase two, um, you know, right, 1993, yeah. So, what is the difference? What is the connection? What are the similarities that you have experienced, you know, amongst the years? Um, similarity. I mean, I don't know. Just the culture. Just the culture is just full blown all over the place. So, uh, where folks understand the culture, you know, they and they get themselves engulfed in a culture that to a lot of people extremely foreign. Mm. So then, you know. Uh, Someone who's born in Kansas coming to play pan with us, and you talk to them as if, as if they're from Trinidad, and they pretty much understand everything, you know, and 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 it's and it's not like you're forcing your culture on someone else. They actually just it just happens naturally. It's an experience. You know, so yeah, yeah, I want this roti, or where I can get a roti, or where I can get some um, Sunday food, or whatever oh, pie, or whatever yeah. <laughs> exactly, and um, that is the main similarity. It does never make you feel like you're away from home. What, if any, difference do you find with the New York panorama season was experienced and the other two, being Florida and um, Trinidad? Well, one one is, well, the even though the culture has been out there, folks haven't been, we haven't had the numbers yet, you know, so to really, we haven't really reached out there entirely to have, like, 
huge bands or huge orchestras like Trinidad to the extent there are a few bands especially in New York you would get like the 100 or what have you um, in Miami we, we had like 30 34 players so it's extremely small and then you know the finances you know not too many even though Pan is out there it's not fully exposed yet so therefore like the government or the, the, the like you know the mayor and all these people would recognize properly so there's a few things that we need to do to get these people more involved and for which would also which would help the steel band community from struggling you know we're struggling a little bit too much and yeah. the land that has a lot of money don't mind the economic downfall as they say there's a lot of money still passing through it we just need to find that gap if there's one thing you can change in panorama uh specifically near panorama at this point what would it be mm. just the way how it's been um, just the way how it's carried around. I mean, the way how it's um, actually being handled. It's not being handled properly as a, there's not a business sense towards things. There's not a respect level towards it. It's like, a lot of people have this old time mentality where one man runs the whole show and does everything. And, okay, I did this. Are we talking organizers, promoters, band everything. leaders? This okay. is everything, I mean, you still have folks that don't really respect the instrument, but still make a lot of money off of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they say, yeah. you know, I mean, they say the, 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 the labor, they makes a lot of money for the panorama, but yet still we get... Millions, millions. Yet, yet still we make, we, the panists get, what, $20,000? That's nothing really, I mean. So, therefore, we have to do a lot more in terms of how we handle, per, how the personnel are being elected, or and what, what's the goal, actually? Because uh, yes, Panorama is the main celebration, but what do we do apart from that? You know, right after Panorama, what are the plans? How are we looking to make it bigger? How are we looking to take it from the museum to maybe a giant stadium? And also yes, so. how to uh, share in the pot that mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. in around uh, exactly. the, uh, the Labor Day time mm -hmm. and from Panorama itself exactly. so that it can trickle down for want of a better term, mm -hmm. to the uh, the performers, the artists. Exactly, themselves. exactly. Because a lot of people leave their jobs early. A guy would travel last night. Um, said that man had to take four buses. So when you look at all that, all this money being spent on all that kind of stuff. And, I mean, yes, there's love and all that kind of stuff, and we treat everybody well. But a little change wouldn't hurt. But it's interesting. Um, you like a very few. Um, fortunate people are able to make a living and it also comes with skill as well mm -hmm. so let's not uh, say that that's not part of it here mm -hmm. but the whole point is you are living in most yes. ways your dream mm -hmm. if you speak to a lot of the people who have a day job or mm -hmm. an alternate or their real-time job and they come together for panorama you ask them would you like to have the opportunity of making pan your life and unhesitatingly they say yes yeah. yeah they would they would very much mm. like to be in similar um arenas like yourself so mm. it's interesting that they love it but they play for love because that's all there exactly. is but exactly. they would really love to be part of symphonies or the uh solo artists yeah. themselves. It's, it's always an interesting mm -hmm. thought process that a lot of people don't seem to no. to, to keep in mind no it's one of the one of the main things is that a lot of people look at musicians, you have to be lucky to get through to where you are so that, you know, not everybody's going to make it as musicians. So that's one of the main things that a lot of people, are, a lot of people look into. Mm -hmm. So therefore now, when someone comes in with a day job, I mean, they, they, that's, that's what they used to actually cancel out the fact that, okay, I would never make it have to get a day job, yeah. you know, because... Well, yeah, you you work hard and you're lucky enough to get there. But me, you know, me, I had kids from young, and this what you know, I had to go find a job, and so my dream went away. Yeah. So that's how a lot of people look at it. Let's talk about Leon Foster Thomas, the <laughs> artist. Now, in yeah. terms of, you know, you've played um, many stages around the world as a Steve Pan artist. Talk about that, you know, how that came about essentially, and. Um, you know, what it means to you to be able to work within the Panorama Arena and still at other parts of the year, 
go off and do, you know, what turns Leon Foster Thomas on. <laughs> so let, let's hear about that. Well, for me, um, growing up in Fonkler, there, I mean, I think, and I, I kind of, I can go on the record for this, um, Fonkler, I think, produces, or produced, I think still produces, I could say produces, some of the best soloists, and even some of the most, the most um, amounts of um, soloists and arrangers from the band. You can't really count them on one hand. And I was lucky enough to fall in that kind of category. There was like one batch came in, and then when that batch left, another batch came in, and, and so forth. So it was a group of us, myself, Jason Farrell, who actually arranged in Canada. He's a really good soloist. Jeffrey Farrell, who died not too long ago. And um, Kevin Gishard, I mean, I was, that's one of the, for me, that's one of the best players on the bass ever. Um, and he can jump on any bass and play and solo, and you just, we go on a gig, you know, we got together one time uh, for my mom's, when my mom died, and we got to the pioneer, and um, we said, okay, we're doing these chords, and I said, just play something on the bass, and he, I didn't have to tell him what note to play, he jumped on, fell in the groove, understood where we had to go, it was just like a, a jazz band. So, I had that, kind, that core of people around me, and I always wanted to sound different. I never wanted to sound like Pro, didn't want to sound like Darren, didn't want to sound like Bugsy. I, because I thought, I always think marketing wise, if I sound like them, they wouldn't, nobody wouldn't want to hire me. Why get a counterfeit of the real thing? Yeah. So I used everything and everyone else around me to get everything um, happening. You know? So then we, um, I, tr I used the uh, marriage of the the jazz and uh, all my experience for the pan and took it to another level. I wanted people to know who Leon Foster Thomas is, you know. And I think it's still a journey that uh, yeah. is being uh, taken and yeah. you are uh, allowing people into the person who Leon Foster Thomas is. I want to stop. <laughs> hey, I hear that. Russia, talk about your experience in Russia. It's one of the best experiences ever. First of all, going to our shows. How did that come about? Well, there's a jam session not too far from my house in Miami. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to the session, and um, these two guys, I mean, this couple actually from Russia, drummer and um, pianist, they were visiting. And I just happened to walk in there, and we played together. And we had a fun time at the, at the jazz club, and I took them to other spots in Miami. Of how, how very little there is in Miami. And uh, we just got a, had a really nice relationship and uh, exchanged numbers. Next thing you know, um, a month or two later, I got an email. How oh, would you like to come to Russia? I said, well, why not? You, know, <laughs> you try everything once, <laughs> if so. And um, first thing I thought about, God, you know, I'm a black man going to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, God has just blessed me enough. Um, I came up to New York last year for the panorama and we met and we, we hooked up and we rehearsed most of, the mu most of the music, got the visa and everything. And right after panorama, like a week, yeah, oh. I went off to Russia. I remember that. And um, actually got detained by customs because they have never seen, they have never seen a, a I know actually a Trinidad passport. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it, like, well, what is this document? I got it, and you know I didn't have the electronic passport. That's what right. I have now. So the the, the woman is swiping the thing at the uh, and it's not, and it's not responding. It's not electronic, right? She sent me the decoder to stand up, and I stood there for like an hour and a half until they got I verification. That, went that when you were like five years old. In yeah. School, right? <laughs> It it was it, it it was an experience. I I called I called them and I said, looks like I'm coming back home. <laughs> and um, after that, every, they got everything resolved because it was nine in the morning or so in Russia. It was extremely early and the day before or whatever. Yeah. And um, it worked out pretty well. I mean, the response was really good. It, once you got out of the airport, yeah. <laughs> once I got out, you know, the the folks. I I didn't speak one word of Russian. Couldn't speak one word of Russian. Now a little bit, you know, but, <laughs> but um, our first uh, performance, we had people from the news and everything like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
actually every city we went there was someone from the news something from the news because they've never seen the pan before and um, we traveled around from Moscow to Yekaterinburg and even to um, Belarus and which is, which is a former which was a former um, territory of Russia but they are extremely poor so even though the show was sold out this people didn't have enough money to buy your CDs or whatever or to give and the one man just really touched me one guy um, he was the sound guy and he had a, a cap and he said the, um, the president gave it to him while he was in the hospital waiting on a heart surgery or something and he was so inspired by the music and the performance he gave me the hat you know what I mean after that I mean that was that was just really moving and what we did after we did a, a second concert at another place for free to raise funds for the um, for the country of Belarus I mean and you would never think that you would have this kind of influence on folks especially when well, we music come, yeah does have music that. it's you know, universal so no surprise there coming from really. a place Trinidad I, I would never say a small place in Trinidad everybody says that you know, I, small big whatever it's just a really good place a place called Trinidad you coming from there that really and truly no one knows where it is what was your repertoire shoot um, we had some of my own compositions from my CD um, torment uh, actually we did uh, obi a wedding and uh, no looking back and then some of their tunes and um, I actually introduced some more calypsos. I did a, a jazz version of Etel, Super Blues Etel, but we kind of kept it in a jazz vibe. But then I had the drummer learn calypso. So I would, um, some of my performances, we would have the audience sing. Mm. You know, so you just saw one, like shake, you know, your promise me, shake. So they would be singing that and and then they went up Etel, and that's all we would know again. <laughs> a Russian audience yeah. singing Etel singing is priceless. I mean, it's something else. You, it's it, it was worth the experience, worth the cold, because um, it was extremely cold. Actually, my second trip there, mm -hmm. and you know, went to Siberia. And this is just so you've been there twice already, twice, and yeah. now you're heading off for your third. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there must be something between you and Russia. It's great. <laughs> I mean, it's a great day. When you get a sold out crowd at every venue that you perform at, it's, and folks never see the pan, you know, they've never heard it. So it's extremely intriguing, especially a European audience compared to an American audience or even a Caribbean audience. There is more appreciation for yeah. music and jazz music in Europe. And even though they don't, Russia is not really considered part of Europe, I mean, they still, it's the same response. Mm -hmm. So therefore now when you have, there's, when I, there's a performance coming, folks, they, they come out in their numbers, they buy the ticket to come and be in it. But now this is your third trip, so therefore mm -hmm. we expect a whole lot more people who yeah. you won over the first and second yeah. times, and now people who've heard about it, and they'll be like, look, you gotta catch this guy, this is mm -hmm. you. So you're part of this group when yeah. you perform. Mm -hmm. All right, um, beside Russia, where else have you gone to? Um, for, well, for the past year, uh, from Russia, well, we did the Panja show in London. We did the Panja show in New York. Uh, I just came from Wisconsin, Birch Creek, Wisconsin. This was something I did. I was uh, sitting in for Liam, Liam Teague. Mm -hmm. And um, myself and Liam, we have been really connecting over the past few years, actually. We talk pretty much on, uh, on Facebook or what have you, emails and stuff. And uh, I'll be doing a performance in uh, not in Illinois in November. Mm -hmm. So Birch Creek was, that was an experience by itself. Because mm. um, what else, did you, what, uh, what other than Green Bay, the Green Bay Packers or cheese, as <laughs> 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 you know about Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. And um, Birch Creek, you know, was extremely far away from everything. Mm -hmm. No phone reception properly, no TV or nothing, but there was a big, it's a camp where kids come together and they get scholarships to perform, mm -hmm. to, um, to learn music. There's, and I did the percussion week. Mm -hmm. 
So from the percussion week, you know, they have a jazz week, they have classical, and then the percussion week. Mm -hmm. you know? So... Um, Second year with Crossfire, how did the arrangement come about that you became the arranger for the band in 2010? <coughs> and of course, it's continued now to 2011. Um, I was drumming my face to um, 2009. Panami, I think we did, we did Panami last year. Last year, sorry. And um, Dougie came by and someone actually, Franco from Sawa East Side, I can't remember his name, Andy, Andy Franco, said somebody wants to talk to you about arranging. I always wanted to arrange, so I mean, he came by and he said, oh, we're looking for a arranger and if you are available, how was that? I said, okay, yeah. I jump at it, you know, and uh, it was pretty tough last year. It wasn't like smooth sailing all the way through. Changing of the guards is always tough. So this is your first panorama band, per se? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, other, other, other than, than Miami, Miami right. Yeah. So this was your was first like, opportunity yeah. for a sizable band. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think this is going to um, open up a door to say in uh, Trinidad as well? Uh, that's what I'm hoping. Okay. I'm trying to do the music good enough to <laughs> get there. <laughs> well, Leon, I mean, it's been really, really great finally sitting down getting to know you, getting to hear from you personally, and we can only wish you the best for Panorama 2011 in New York. Um, more great things in terms of your global performances, mm -hmm. uh, your tours, and of course, whatever you wish best for yourself, especially in the Trinidad and Tobago yeah. arena, which <laughs> your heart is set on. Yeah. So thank you very much for chatting with Wen Steel Talks. Pleasure is all And all the best. Thank you. Wen Steel Talks. Everybody listens. Listen.